Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about imputed righteousness. And this is a very important term uh, when understanding the finished work, because um, God is really, um, he is giving us all that we need. Uh, and, and we have said in previous classes that uh, all of who he is, is all of who we are. And uh, this word imputed righteousness is found in Romans chapter four, verse three through six, and also in the same chapter nine through 12. And we see a couple examples here. Uh, Abraham, for instance, okay, in verse two, for if Abraham was justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Uh, so he just, again, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, uh, to, uh, to our, sorry, he's speaking to the Romans, he's saying, listen, the only boast that we have is in Christ, because everything that we have in our life is because of Christ. So I want to, so the whole emphasis is do not establish your own righteousness. Do not evaluate yourself, do not compare yourself, do not justify yourself based on your own works. Even if they're good works, they're not good enough. And I think a lot of religion is living in their own righteousness, which is called self-righteousness. Okay. But in 2 Corinthians 5.21, I think, gives the best definition of imputed righteousness. And before we turn there, uh, we see here, let's go back to chapter 4 of Romans. Um, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So when you talk to people and you share the gospel, your people may say to you, oh, it's so simple. Oh, that's too easy. All I have to do is believe. And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because believing is our heart consent to trust and to say, that I am not enough, I could never do enough, I could never be enough to earn or to merit God's favor. So this is why imputed righteousness is so incredibly valuable in a believer's life, because we can now rest in his love, we can now rest in his truth, and we now can rest in his grace, and his grace is what now labors in my life, right? And it's now the spirit of God that labors and uh, we are believing. Now, someone might say, well, believing, it, it sounds so like minimal, but actually that word believe is uh, really an, an action of agreement, walking alongside, submitted to God saying, Lord, I am acting in your spirit and in your power otherwise verse four if i'm working if i'm working then it's just debt i'm trying to pay back a debt and a lot of christians a lot of christian um messages is all about debt 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 pray more do more read more give more um mm -hmm. which are all excellent things but really grace changes our motivation where Galatians 5, 6, we are loved, therefore faith is produced in us, right? We are forgiven, therefore we forgive others. And we're going to talk about forgiveness tonight. Um, it's a different type of angle where Christ does the heavy lifting. And let's look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He imputes all of himself so that we stand holy, we stand perfect, we stand totally a product of the grace of God. We are declared righteous, and not only that, we are justified. We said last class the word justification means vindication. We are no longer guilty in the eyes of God, but we are now, uh, we are now free. 
and we are now precious in his sight. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a verse that we hear a lot, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Okay, he did not sin, but he was the propitiation, and he and he stood in our place. The, the judge says, you are guilty. Jesus stands up and says, I will take that. I will take that debt, 1 John 2, 2, and I will stand and become sin. And he did not know any sin, which confirms he he was um, he had a free will, but he did not use it in any other way but to glorify the Father, that we might be made, big word there, made the righteousness, the righteousness of God in him. So again, we can really tell our message. If it's Christ-centered, then it's going to be a product of what Christ has done. And I think this might be simple for us because we've heard it a lot. But, in, I mean, wouldn't you say when you talk to the average person, they are constantly striving to be good enough, to be holy enough, to be religious enough, uh, and they're being just legalistic. And when they do well... They enter into self-righteousness, which means, hey, look at what I've done. I'm a good person. Don't you know how good I am? And it's all rubbish to God. God says in Isaiah 64, 6, that even our good is filthy rags. Now, that's not a that's not an exciting or popular message, but we first must go to this place of depravity, which is saying, God. I am nothing without you, John 15, 5, but I'm everything uh, with you or as a product of grace. So, so imputed righteousness, uh, big, big point here. So Christ has become our righteousness. Christ has become that. So when you and I stand before God today, we could not do it without Christ. Like if someone's trying to just be uh, subject to the moral law, thinking that it will appease the royal law, then that person will be very disappointed when they stand before God. Right? Right? People will say, I'm a good person. I don't murder anybody. I don't kill. I don't rob. But it's all based in my righteousness. And God says it's not enough. So in Romans chapter 4, um, we see David as an example in verse six, even David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes his righteousness without work. So again, God is giving us uh, everything that pertains to life and godliness, right? Ephesians one, three, someone might say, I don't have patience. I don't have joy. I don't have love. I don't have uh, grace. And that is true. But God imputes it, or he brings it, and he lets us be the ultimate beneficiary of it. So we have his patience. We have his grace. We have his love. And this is why the Christian life is really surrendering and letting him increase and we decrease, right? So let me just say a couple more things. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven— and whose sins are covered. So I want to touch on that in a moment. But so number one, it's imputed righteousness. Christ has become our righteousness. Okay. That's amazing. So today we believe, we agree, and we walk in the spirit. Okay. That's why we desire the things of God, because our spirit is alive, right? The unregenerated man does not desire the things of God. Because they're full of themselves, right? Yep. We see that in 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The natural mind does not understand the things of God, right? Number two is perfect righteousness, okay? God is perfectly righteous, which means holy. That's why no one has ever seen God. And if they did, they would, they would be totally annihilated, right? Because God is totally holy. So without Christ, we would never have a relationship with God. We would never be accepted by God. But in Ephesians 1, 7, 
not only are we accepted, but we're called beloved. And I love this word. It says praise to the glory of his grace, because it was all God that was the bridge between man and God. That was Jesus Christ was that bridge. All right. So let's look at James 117. So when we share our faith, um, we honestly, as as Americans, and I don't mean to pull that card, but in the West, we are very production minded. We are very self oriented to proclaim ourselves. But um, in our in our message, we have to really share with people that listen. It's not about you and me. It's not about what we can produce for God. It's not even about our goodness. It's really about the perfect work of Jesus Christ. Okay. And I want to go into that for a minute. But John, uh, James 117, every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, to whom there is no variable variableness, neither shadow of turning. Okay. He's perfect. Okay. There is no darkness in him at all in 1 John chapter 1. No darkness. He is flawless. He is perfect. He is superior. Right? Hebrews 7, 7, my favorite verse. The superior blesses the inferior. It's a great verse. 7, 7 of Hebrews. God says, I will be the lowest of low so that I can raise man to the highest of high. That One day he'll be with me. I am superior, therefore, I will graciously bless the inferior. And we thank God every day for that. Amen. It's amazing. All right, let's look at Romans 3.25. So perfect righteousness means it is totally perfect and holy. Romans 3.25 uh, and 26 uh, who God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. And we're going to talk about the blood of Christ because that is what totally is declares our, uh, our righteousness in Christ. It's the blood of Christ. So through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. So if we can say to people, listen, I know you're a good person. I know you've done all these great things. And this is why religious people are difficult to lead to Christ oftentimes because they're so full of their, their goodness. But God says, you have to see your need for me. You have to see that you're bankrupt, you're naked, you're destitute without me. So, all right, let's turn back to Romans 4. That's good news, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It gets better. There's judicial there's judicial righteousness. Okay, that's number. So imputed righteousness, perfect righteousness, now judicial righteousness, okay? That's in Romans 5, 2. That means Jesus was the only one that could stand on our behalf. He's the only one that could shed his blood because it was perfect. There was nobody else that could take our place. So judicially, he stands perfectly for us. So this is why the Father, God the Father, when he looks at you, he sees his son. Right? We can still grieve the spirit. We can still quench the spirit. We can still insult the spirit, right? The Holy Spirit, the buffer, the, the one that is actively energizing the work of God in us. It, 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 there is still sin still um, has impact absolutely on us. Absolutely. But the father looks at the son and says, you stand I am you, you are me, right? It's the John 17 principle. Everyone that you've given me, I have lost none. And I've done that for the glory of you. John 17, amazing chapter. Let's look at that for a minute. 
<laughs> you guys good? We good? Yeah. All right. Uh, John 17. I mean, this is this chapter really, you could preach a, a thousand messages out of this chapter or more. Uh, <laughs> see, verse 17:4, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work. <laughs> Five. Oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which thou hast given before the world was. I have manifested your name, six, unto the, unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. They, thine they were, and thou gavest thou them to me, and they, and, and they have kept thy word. word. Whew, some good King James English right there. Um, <laughs> New standard. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, this is verse eight. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest to me, and they received them and have known surely I've come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send, send me. It's amazing. Um, uh, oh boy. Uh, verse 14 I've given them thy word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world even as i am not of the world it's amazing so 1717 sanctify them set them apart to my to the truth my word is truth again 19 all right so righteousness is really important this is why this is why religion has the wrong source it has the wrong starting point when because religion is all about performance it's all about debt it's all about me 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 achieving something where righteousness is i want to get to know god so that that causes us to surrender our will to god so now it's no longer i that live but Christ liveth in me. It's no, I'm bought with a price, right? First Corinthians 6 19. All right. I want to shift here for a minute. Um, he says something here in Romans chapter 4. Uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 7. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin okay huge words he will not impute sin okay so this is why is that so in, incredibly important and i forgot something okay i forgot them before i go there there's another righteousness okay there's another righteousness so what there's imparted uh, excuse me imputed there's perfect righteousness Righteousness, there's judicial righteousness, there's self-righteousness, but then there is imparted righteousness, okay? Imparted righteousness. Now, imparted righteousness is progressively experiencing our faith, okay? The technical definition is we are progressively experiencing our faith as we take in the word of God and apply it by faith. Okay. Imparted. Okay. Imputed means it happened the moment at salvation. That's our position. We are declared righteous. But imparted means in parts, I am learning and experiencing everything that God says. Okay. That's one of the greatest accusations in Christianity. I don't experience God. I don't sense God. I don't. And it's because the imparted righteousness happens through obedience. Like you showing up tonight, God is going to add to your faith. He's going to, he's going to add uh, something supernatural to your, to your life personally. All right. Let's look at Romans eight, four. I don't want to miss this. So imparted means God is, he's looking at you positionally, holy, but, progressively 
you and I are being sanctified and we're becoming more and more like him. Okay. So imparted. So Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be, be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So, so this is why when we get saved, you know, we could say, God, why don't you just, you know, take away our sin? We'd be, you know, why couldn't we just be perfect? Why do we have to like wrestle with the natural man? And it's because God says, I did everything for you, but now I want you to recognize the value of it and experience the beauty of it. Okay. It's like someone saying, I, you know, I know I'm forgiven and then they fail and they reap the consequences of their failure, but then they discover mercy. And it's like, mm -hmm. wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like an apple pie tastes a whole lot better when you're hungry. Right. It's the same principle. If I'm if I'm stuffed, right, I'm not going to appreciate the apple pie. But if we're starving hungry and we recognize the beauty of that apple pie, then that's going to taste sweeter. It's going to taste even more amazing, right? How many want apple pie right now? Yeah, absolutely. So imparted righteousness. This is why you and I come to church and we open our Bibles. We fellowship one with another because we're learning this moment by moment step by step decision by decision okay make sense we good Amen. all right i want to get to something uh briefly here so forgiveness let's look back here four seven and eight eight in particular the lord will not impute sin so who did he impute sin to? Jesus Christ. Right. All of our sin was on Christ. Right? Colossians 2, 14. 1 John 2, 2. John 3, 16. John 3, 17. Right? There's now no condemnation for those who are walking in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Because Christ took all of our sin, past, present, and even the future. So this is why our message is not about sin, not even about repentance. Okay, that was John the Baptist's message, and that's a beautiful word, but it doesn't come before the word believe, because no one knows how to repent unless they first are confronted with the goodness of God. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. But this is a big word. God does not look at you and I in our sin. We look at ourselves in our sin. We do. We remember our sin. We could probably tell each other, I don't recommend it, how many times we sin in a certain area. And we can do that. We can be like the bean counter, right? What's a bean counter? It's someone that counts their beans to make sure they have enough beans for their, for their food. God does not count the beans. He does not count our sin. Why? Because all of our sin went on Christ. <clears throat> so, now let me make sure we're not going to misunderstand each other here. That sin is missing the mark. It's falling short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, right? 623 it's the wages of sin that is as the consequence of death physical and spiritual right <clears throat> but god looks at you outside of your sin and i i think i'm saying this saying it over and over because we remember people's sin we remember our sin we judge people based on their sin we become the judge and the jury and god is saying i don't impute sin i have taken it and the only thing you need to do in first john 1 7 through 9 is agree with me that this is missing the mark of holiness when we agree with god he is he justifies us cleanses us from all unrighteousness 
and he removes our sins. So if we go back to the same sin and over and over and over, we know in 1 John chapter 4 that habitual sin is because someone is, is void of love or love has not been perfected in that individual, right? We know that. Um, so let me illustrate this because I think this is very important because we're natural creatures. We look at things based on the senses uh, and we're quick to identify what's wrong, right? So we understand, first of all, that when we sin, we break fellowship. We do not break position, right? For us that have kids, if our kids have done something wrong, we don't throw them out of the family. We don't say you're no longer part of the family. No, even if we do that, the blood is still the blood, right? And Christ is saying you break fellowship, but you do not break um, position. So Isaiah 30 verse one, we are quick to repent, agree with God, name it, forsake it, and move on. So we don't add sin to sin because the wages of sin is destruction, <laughs> right? But he says here, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So God died for the sins of the whole world, but the one that he hasn't imputed it to is the believer, an unbeliever, if they die, they die in their sin. They rejected the very, the very provision for sin. They rejected it. And so therefore, they'll be judged because they rejected the only provision for sin. But the believer, God says, when, you, when we stand before God, it's not going to be a list of all the sins we did. You sinned 3,486,210 times. And we have a lot to talk about. No, it's not going to be like that not going to be like that it's going to be it's going to literally be about opportunities and how we walked with god in time how we chose god and how we maybe missed opportunities okay so that's isn't that good that's a great that's a great revelation so so if we look through the book of psalms david is saying <laughs> create in me a clean heart search my heart know me if there's any wicked way what was David doing? He was he was agreeing and wanting to walk in God's uh, God's uh, imputed righteousness. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Uh, forgiveness, Galatians three thirteen, good verse. Galatians three thirteen, Christ became a curse so that we would not be cursed. Okay. Christ would not. Christ was hanging on a tree. Every, cursed is the man that's on the tree, dies on the tree, and he took that so that we would never be cursed. Right. So today, when we meet a broken person, it isn't clean up your life so God will accept you. No, it's come as you are, fall on the mighty hand of God, and He will raise you up. That's why our message is a message of truth and love and forgiveness and therefore he makes us holy he makes us obedient he makes us faithful all right so the blood of christ the blood of christ does three things i want to look at that with you with you for a minute so uh i'm going to give you a couple verses here verses you know hebrews 9 22 without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. There's no answer for sin. Blood had to be shed. Okay. 914, the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience and washes our heart with clean water. It removes the stain of sin. Do we still sin? Absolutely. We have a sin nature, but we sin less and less. Okay. So number one. The blood covers us. That's First Peter 4, 8. The blood covers us. So that means when God looks at us, he sees the blood of his son. And he says this in Isaiah 1, 18.
we're sinners. Yes, that's that's who we are in our disposition, but in our position, and this is what regulates our fellowship and our standing with God is that we're covered in the blood of Christ. First Peter 4 8. Love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't condone it, but it's the one thing that stands between me and the sinner. It's the covering, covering, right? It's like throwing a bucket of paint on somebody, right? Or better yet, it's like jumping to a pool. You're totally wet as you go under the water. It's the same principle. You and I are totally covered in the blood. So today, our past or our present or our future cannot disrupt the blood. Romans 8, 37 through 39, nothing can separate us from, from who God is in us. All right, number two, the blood cleanses us, okay? So there is a term called comparative righteousness. And we kind of gave that definition without giving the term comparative righteousness, which is, hey, I'm comparing myself with other people and I'm coming out on top. Right. Comparative righteousness. And second Corinthians 10, 12 says that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea because God cleanses us from our unrighteousness. So. The accuser, the devil, Romans 12, 10, he's constantly telling us about our sin, constantly telling us what we've done wrong. But what overcame the devil? The blood of the lamb and the word of its testimony. Right? 12, 11 there. It's very, very important. So, When the devil comes to accuse you, you can say the confession of the blood says, no matter how guilty I look, Zechariah 3, 3, Joshua had dirty garments and Jesus gave him new garments. Okay, that's amazing. So our past, which tries to hijack our present, doesn't have to happen because the blood covers us. And the blood cleanses us in 1 John 1, 7 through 9. It cleanses us. And there's a beautiful word. It's exolifine. It's a word we've used in the past. But to blot out from Isaiah 44, 22, it is amazing. It is, he blots out, he removes the trace of all of our sin. Isn't that amazing? It removes all the trace of our sin. And then thirdly, the blood creates us brand new. Okay, so what are those three things? Number one is what? Blood covers us. Covers us. <clears throat> cleanses us, right? And what's the third one? Makes us brand new. Yeah. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a a verse we know by heart, right? But what a revelation that we are made new. And this is what heals the brokenhearted. This is what heals those that are so. And the answer is, you're right. We would never be without Christ. So. There's forgiveness, and that's a big word. To forgive means to release someone of their offense, okay? Forgiveness, to release someone of their offense, okay? Now, I'm, I'm going to say something maybe o- over simplistic here. When you and I release somebody of their offense, it means this. It means, Lord, you have forgiven me of much greater. Therefore, I'm not going to hold that person hostage, even though they are guilty. I'm not the judge. I'm going to release them. Okay? That doesn't mean I'm going to go on vacation with them, but it just means in my spirit, I'm not going to be the judge and the jury. 
I'm going to forgive or to give something before. To forgive means to give something before. So I'm going to give that person what they don't deserve, and that's to treat them in my mind, in my heart, like Christ treated us, right? He that sinneth much, loveth much, right? We know that principle. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean I'm there to change that person. Somebody might say, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Well, I really believe if you and I release that person of their offense, the Holy Spirit will replace that tragic, whatever that is, he'll replace it with something from the blood of Christ, something new. So let's say I can't forgive somebody. Well, it's because I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm acting like the judge and jury. I've not released that person from the offense. L let me illustrate that there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting verse here. And I, I think we have a few more minutes here. Uh, look at, look at Leviticus 14 for a minute. You guys doing okay? We are all right? Yes, the blood. All right. So the blood, the blood overcomes and it speaks better things, right? That's why I want to have a message that's, that's doused in blood, right? Mm. Right. Doused. So Leviticus 14. So interesting, interesting verse here that's worth your meditation because obviously time is going to fail us here. But um, so think about it. Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of a person is in the blood. So genetically, we've inherited through the bloodline sin from Adam. So we're contaminated. But the blood of Christ is perfect. And it's without spot, without blemish. And this is why his blood covers and cleanses us and makes us a new creation. But look at this illustration. This is very interesting. Leviticus 14. One through seven. So they're talking here about leprosy, which is a which is a type of sin in the Old Testament. And it says here, it shows the offering here in verse four that the priest commanded to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. You look at that. That's a description of the cross in the Old Testament right there. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them in the living bird in the, in the blood of the bird that was killed over running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into an open field. <clears throat> this is the gospel. We see that the cross, the shedding of blood, and Christ was the bird that was killed. And his blood was sprinkled seven times, which speaks of perfection, on you and I. And we, it cleanses us. It makes us new. And we are released into the world as a product of redemption, a product of his righteousness. Isn't that awesome? Exactly. It's amazing. It's amazing. And in counseling, in counseling, this is this is our message that that you are free in Christ, not to live like your own way, but to live according to the way of Christ. Amen. So let me give you a couple verses for your meditation and then we can we can have some QA, okay? So the blood of Christ. Jeremiah 50 20. Jeremiah 50 20. Our sin is cast behind his back and he remembers it no more. That's also Hebrews 8 12. He remembers your sin no more. Why? Because he doesn't impute sin. He doesn't do it. 
So here's another good verse, Psalm 103, 10 through 12. God does not deal with you and I in our sin. He only deals with us in the economy of grace. So if I sin, if I go out, drink, and I drive, and I run over somebody, yes, there's judgment and consequence, but mercy rejoices over that with the grace to handle the consequence, right? But that's not how God deals with me now. That's why these the AA and these other uh, addiction programs, which I'm not against, I, I think some of them are excellent, but you never start off by saying, hi, my name is XYZ and I'm an alcoholic. No, that's not who I am. It might be what I do, but it's not who I am. Why? Because my sin is not my identity. Romans 7.20, I'm not my sin. I'm not my, I'm not a stealer. I'm not a thief. I'm not a whoremonger. I'm not a jealous person. Those are things that we do maybe in our fallen nature, but it is not who Christ is that we are. Micah 6, 8, another great verse. I am down. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. I am down, but I will rise again. Right? It's amazing. Jude 24. Jude 24. He keeps us from falling to present us faultless before his father. How is that possible? It's the blood. So as we get to know this message, our appetite for sin gets less and less, and we have power in our personal life. And if we fail, we repent, we respond to grace, and we agree with God. All right, let's, Romans 5, real quick. I got to read this verse. Romans 5, 17. This is an amazing verse. So the next time the devil wants to remind you of your sin, you can say, Listen, I've repented of that, and it's it's I'm not that's not that's not who I am. It's not imputed. It's a big word. Isn't that a big word? Yeah. Yeah, amen. <laughs> All right. You guys are such good listeners. I'm sorry. All right. We're closing in one moment. We're closing. 517. For if by one man's offense death, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundant grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to, to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under the justification of life. There it is. So if I'm if I have an addiction or a personal sin in my life, then what do I need to do? I need to come to God and say, Lord, tell me who I am in your righteousness. Let your life fill this great void that that brings me back to the pit and back to the vomit. Mm -hmm. It's not that I try to stop sinning because that's not the more I try to stop sinning, the more I'll sin. The strength of sin is in the law. But if we get that void in our heart filled with the righteousness of God, then we have power in our personal life. Wow. So we'll finish Romans 4. Uh, well, actually, you can see verse 9 through 12. It's different examples of how God said, I am going to take care of all their baggage, all their sin, all their genetic flaws. I'm going to I'm going to lay my life down so they can take up my life. He talks about circumcision. He talks about Abraham, again, the father of our faith. Again, it was not something that we could earn, but it was accounted unto Abraham because of belief. So, maybe I'll stop there. And um, how many say amen?